Hello and welcome to the Digital Schoolhouse Careers Panel, which I think is the highlight of the day. Sure, there's some Super Smash Bro happening, but I feel like this is where it's at today. So hello and welcome. My name's Ella Sillywood and I have got some incredible guests for you today. We've really picked people who have some of the coolest jobs in games. So I'm gonna get right to it and let them quickly introduce themselves for you, starting off with Abubakar. Oh, hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Abu, and I'm an actor as well as a producer, but I'm also a game developer running a studio called uh, Silver Rain Games. Jade, how about you? Hello, my name's Jade, she, her. Um, I'm a game music composer and sound designer, and I just recently I joined the Silver Rain's team as the audio producer. Lovely. And Nida? Hi, I'm Nida. I'm a user experience designer and user researcher at NetSpeak Games. I'm also part of the founding team of Plug and Play, which is an initiative to get more people of colour into the industry. Fantastic. And finally, Wayne. Hi, I'm Wayne Emmanuel. Uh, I work at TikTok uh, and run uh, their strategic gaming partnerships team for Europe and Russia. See, did I not tell you we had the coolest guests? They've all got very <laughs> exciting jobs. So I'm thrilled that we have them here today to tell you a little bit more about how they got into the industry. So that's going to be my first question. I'm interested in what you do now and how you got where you are. So what got you interested in the games industry and what was your kind of step through the door? Um, Wayne, I'll start off with you. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I've always loved games as a, as a child. Um, I think the first console we had in our house was a Game Boy, um, and it pretty much grew from there. Um, for me, I would say Metal Gear Solid kind of changed everything for me, and that's where it kind of um, it gave me an idea that actually games could be so much more um, to the point that I wanted to work in the industry, but I had zero intention in terms of making games because I don't think I'm particularly creative in that way. Um, so yeah, kind of found an interest in um, in gaming and uh, ended up kind of going through studying kind of uh, marketing and uh, um, GCSE level um, business studies as well um, and kind of uh, found my way into the industry uh, back in, I think, 2012 or 2011 um, at King who make Candy Crush. Um, so that was kind of my first step into the sector, I guess. And... Abu, you're someone who also kind of started out in a different area, but you have ended up making games, right? Yeah, so um, I started off as an actor, um, and I still am. I still am an actor by trade. Uh, but uh, my first sort of uh, video game uh, within the acting world was Assassin's Creed Origins, and that kind of opened my eyes to what it means to actually make a game. Uh, seeing the people who work, you know, behind the scenes and everything. And that was where really my excitement came from. Because I didn't really know that you could actually, you know, I, 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 there's a lot of mystery to a degree about games and developing and creating games. You know, I was just an avid gamer rather than necessarily knowing that there's an idea of making games. And so, yeah, that sort of opened my eyes to it. And uh, since then, I've still been doing, you know, acting pieces here and there. But then I paired up with uh, Melissa Phillips and we've just started... Um, uh, you know, Silver Rain Games and kind of started with the, we're going with the idea of trying to make games now. Yeah. Fantastic. And obviously, Jade, that's where you've ended up as well. So tell us a little bit about your journey <laughs> to kind of Silver Rain Games. Um, sure. So I, I grew up in a very typical Asian household. So I was very immersed in learning music and my parents encouraged me to like, yeah, um, encouraged me to keep pursuing music in that way so my dad bought me a sony playstation one as like a well done for passing your grade three piano exams and through that i discovered things like final fantasy and absolutely fell in love with the soundtracks and from there that's when i'm like okay i really want to study music seriously now and through gcse's a levels and university um I tried to focus more on the music tech side, so I don't have a traditional, uh, a traditional music tra trajectory in that way. And then through that, after finishing university, I just attended a lot of game meetups and networking, and kind of focused more on freelancing. And then only in the last like few months, um, Mel just uh, messaged me over Twitter and said, "Like, hey, do you want to?" 
maybe work together at Silver Ring Games. And I was like, yeah, sure. And that's pretty much what happened. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I love that story so much. Also, do you even work in sound in games if you didn't fall in love with Final Fantasy? I feel like whenever I talk to someone who does music, <laughs> that's always such a big part somewhere, <laughs> always. And yeah. of course, neither. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? It, it? Genuinely, the music from that is so, and because there's been so many of them, like, let's be clear, <laughs> it feels like no matter what age you are as well, you listen to Final yeah. Fantasy. Yes. So Nida, tell us a little bit about your career journey because you have kind of a, um, an unusual job, one that perhaps I think people don't know about outside of the games industry as much as they know kind of traditional game design roles. Yeah, so uh, as many people on the panel, I did grow up with games, but it wasn't like a huge part of my life. It's just something I did as an activity with my brothers and I kind of fell off games for a bit till I got into university. Uh, where I studied psychology. So I was looking to go into that type of field, like becoming a therapist or something. Um, and then I joined my university's Game Dev Society just out of interest and in seeing what it's about. And through there, I participated in game jams and got an internship whilst I was studying, uh, doing the psychology of games. So like even that studio didn't know what psychology, like what way psychology could contribute to games. But I came in and said like, you know, we can make design better in this way or more ethical in this way. Um, and from there, it's just spearheaded into now at NetSpeed Games, where I lead on UX and user research. It's been quite a journey. So for anyone um, who doesn't know what kind of UX is or how how we use that within games, you know, what, what you have to do kind of day to day. Tell us a little bit more about, you know, what you are doing when you go into the office or work from home, I guess, as we all are now. What are you doing kind of each day? So my key job is to ensure like the player's voice is at the center of development and design. Um, and the way I do that is using psychology, obviously, but also scientific research methods just to validate uh, our results. Uh, so some days I will be talking to our users, figuring out, you know, what do they like about our game? What don't they like? And understanding what we can improve. Uh, and then I'll feed that back to the team. And from there, we'll make new design decisions uh, that make the game experience much more smoother and much more interesting. Um, and I'll collaborate with everyone within the team, from designers to programmers to artists, to even the business people, figuring out what they need and how I can help them uh, bring their vision to life, right? And kind of translate that intent, that design intent, into something really fascinating. And then the other part of it is once that prototype is made, um, I then bring it to the players and test it with them directly as well. So we've got this constant feedback loop and communication with our users. Um, and that's who we're making the game for, right? Um, so we're going to make sure that their voice is always heard in the development process. Oh, it sounds so rewarding. It sounds like such a lovely, <laughs> such a lovely job. Yeah. Jade, for you, what's day in your life like? Oh, uh, uh, me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Bearing in mind that your boss is listening. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so, so maybe pre-Silver Rain adventures, um, I, I mostly just uh, mostly talk to the developers and see what is their kind of more creative and narrative vision in terms of how can writing music or the audio design help uplift um, the impact of the narration? Um, how can it make the gameplay a little bit more like like the feel good game parts of it? Um, and to be honest, it's just basically spreadsheets, and we kind of go through the design process and say like, okay, what kind of music do you envision for like this um, story cutscene? And then what kind of music do you envision for maybe the gameplay? And then what I usually do is I'll try to collect maybe some like reference tracks and say like, oh, is this like the energy level that you're thinking of going to? Do you want the music to match the energy level of the gameplay? Or maybe we can do something really cool and make it not match and see what kind of... Um, I guess, emotional journeys we can create when we combine music and the design together. And that's basically it. And then going through that, I create a brief for myself and then I try to write music to that, put it in the game, test it and do more tests or it will stay in the game. That's usually it. <laughs> What elements of gameplay are you using to kind of make those decisions? You know, what which are the sections that you kind of have to think, okay, this is what will influence the music I create here? 
Uh, usually it's actually their animations. So if if the design has a lot of like really fast animations, then I feel like the music should either match it or or do something quite different to either elevate those animations because I think gamers are very visual people, but they don't necessarily consciously think about the audio. Um, visually, it's, you know, people talk about, oh yeah, when, it, when you do this attack, um, lots of things happen, like numbers everywhere. But audio is, is, is a bit mystical in some ways because it's not like you can touch it or feel it. You, you, well, sorry, no, you, you can't touch it, but you can feel it, but you may not necessarily know how to talk about it you could just say oh yeah it feels good <laughs> and that's um yeah so so trying to communicate with someone who may not be knowledgeable in musical terms it's it's a challenge but when we get it right it, it does feel good <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> abu how did she do was that okay you, you're happy with everything she it said was, there? <laughs> it was great, absolutely it was all all all, all makes sense <laughs> No, no secrets you, given away. No, yeah. no, not 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 many secrets. No. <laughs> so, tell us a little bit about your a day in your life, and obviously, there's kind of two sides there. So, tell me a little bit first mm. about kind of being a voice actor and what's that what that's like in games, and then a little bit about your kind of yeah. new role and what it's like to you know head up a game studio. Sure. Yeah. I mean, like it's. I, I guess so. Yeah. So the one side being a being an actor, voice actor, kind of thing is like normally. Most of the work and and stuff that comes through are, are through my agent, uh, through my voiceover agent, or sometimes even my acting agent. And um, with that, they would you know send me like a script or a piece, and then I'd either go to the studio or record it here at home, and then send it off and see you know whether it fits the world in which the developers are creating, or if it fits you know another world that they might be building later. So a lot of that that's like one side of it that's really purely the voice side whereas the um there's another side with the motion capture which you actually have to physically go to a studio put on this incredibly lovely tight suit and dance around and you know pretend to be a, a character uh, that's um you know that's a complete other side which kind of is more more active and then when it comes to actually the um developer side of, of things a lot of it really, to be honest, is me coming up with ideas and Mel saying, no, that's crazy. Um, like, you know, can we have like a really cool haberdashery over here? And Mel would be like, why is there a haberdashery in this world? And so that's basically what my job normally entails now with the studio. It's communicating with people and talking with the team and, you know, thinking of ideas of how can we make the, the player feel, feel like and have a good time playing this game and then Mel being like, that is incredibly expensive. Maybe we could do that if we had like 10 million. That's my job. <laughs> I like it. Wayne, tell me about a day in your life. Does it include any haberdashery? Um, as far as I can tell, no. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I guess the day in my life. So my, my role is very kind of business centric. Um, so I work with a lot of developers and publishers uh, across the board. So it's not, uh, I, I guess it's not as exciting as, as um, what we've just heard, but um, I mean, it does mean. I mean, TikTok, so let's just, you know, <laughs> TikTok's sure, very sure. exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it absolutely is. Um, I mean, in terms of like the everyday, it's really about relationship management. So uh, I spend a lot of my days kind of speaking to um, developers from AAAs to indie studios, um, both local and international in terms of their reach and their size, and just finding ways we can collaborate. And that's pretty much been, that's the, the similar kind of thing that I've done um, since I've been working in games. So um, having uh, doing a very similar role which was kind of brand partnerships working with brands um and agencies in terms of uh them uh across our uh games things like candy crush uh and then also did the same when i moved over to rovio it was very much very business centric um finding ways that we can uh, find value um from our side as a public as a developer of games seeing if we can share or exchange value with that part, whether it's a, a brand or a, a client of some kind so that's kind of what i still do today yeah, my life i spent at an ngo at a charity setting up a, a gaming uh, partnerships team there 
that was vastly different because I had to understand the world of charity. But at the same time, um, I learned a lot more about the gaming industry in the sector because it opened up the gates in terms of who we could work with and find innovative ways of collaborating and fundraising for that particular charity, which was War Child. So, um, so there was a number of things I've had to learn to, to, uh, to be able to kind of do that. But a lot of it is, is down to relationship management um and understanding the sector in terms of like key players who are decision makers um just even seasonality around game launches and releases and and finding ways to collaborate and partner I mean, I, the thing I love about your job is it's another example of a way that you can work in the games industry with the games industry, but isn't a role, you know, that people traditionally think of. They don't realize, oh, I could work with game companies to kind of create cool content to build interesting things. You know, it doesn't always have to be if you love games, it doesn't have to be that you make them. There are lots and lots of different ways to work around games and to still, you know, have that cool games industry life, which I am just going to say is pretty amazing. So next up, I kind of want to discuss a little bit about the skills that you need to do your job, because obviously we have lots and lots of different courses in the UK. There are lots of different ways that you can learn skills that will get you into games. So I'm interested in what for you are the key things that make you good at your job. Abu, I'm going to start off with you. Oh, yeah, I think, oh, God, um, skills, oh, boy, something that, uh, yeah, no, I think there's, 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 a, there's a few things, right? I think ultimately one of the things that is, is useful is to know, is, is to kind of get in in regards to, you know, talking to other game devs or talking to people, attending more of this stuff to sort of gain knowledge in regards to that, in regards to the, the world of it all. Um, when it comes to skill, I think, again, just um, it depends on the area in which you want to go in. So for me, as you know, who, who's kind of leaning more towards the idea of design and looking at gameplay features and stuff, it's, it's more about, you know, learning about different types of elements of play and learning about different types of games, the different systems that are that are needed there. And then talking also to like either the you know the programming team or the um or even like you know the audio team and seeing what is necessary, what kind of language is needed and necessary to sort of uh plump up and you know uh, the uh the sort of the documents in order to uh kind of be clear for everyone. So yeah it's, um again it's 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 funny because it, it really does range and depend on the skill on on what you want to focus on. You know, if it's if it is programming, it is you know either language in regards to like C plus plus or C sharp or, or all that kind of stuff. But there's even you know now there's all sorts of really cool engines that don't even allow you re don't you don't even have to know this language in order to kind of make a game, which is really cool. I think it is. It's 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 a tricky one because it's it's of course you do need skills depending on what you want to focus, but ultimately it, it's it's it depends on what you really want to you know what you want to what you want to do and and just keep talking to people yeah i mean and that's that's really interesting because you do have that kind of real mix of skills there Nida, I'm interested in your role because it's a little bit more technical, isn't it? So what, what are the skills you need, whether that is kind of personal skills and, you know, uh, qualities that you have as a person or the kind of technical things that you have to know to do the job that you do? Yeah, just building on from Abu's point, like it, it's very different. Like UX is such a broad discipline, so it depends on where you fall. Do you lean more towards like UI design where you want to create the screens and the mockups or do you want to lean more towards the research side of things? and run more uh, play tests. But I think a lot of what UX comes down to is helping the team uh, understand and solve the problems that they have. So let's say if we get some play test feedback saying players had an issue with certain features. My job would then be getting the team together and kind of breaking down that problem and devising a solution together. So is it working with our UI designer to create a new screen design or is it working with the game designer to create a new flow for that system and teaching that system. Um, it very much comes down to developing those communication skills, which to be honest, I'm still learning. Um, it's an ongoing process with any skills that you have. It's just helping people find the common language, but also understanding what they're trying to say. Um, it's very much an empathy driven role, right? Empathy for your players, but also empathy for your team members because we all have the same goal. So it's ensuring we're all in line with that. Um, on the technical end, so I can't technically even draw, and that's completely fine as a UX person, as long as you can communicate your ideas through like sketches, 
which can be literally pen and paper, or they can be different types of tools you can use, like Figma and Sketch. Um, some people use Balsamic as well, and you can create like black and white wireframes, um, which is essentially just showing your team like the steps that you think a player will go through when they're experiencing a feature. And then I will then explain why I've made the decisions that I have. Like a big part of my job is justifying the decisions I've made um, because it does impact the rest of the team as well. Um, so yeah, like as we said, a variety of skill sets, but it will vary depending on the job you have. Wayne, for you, what are the skills that make you good at your job? What do you need to kind of do the job that you do? Yeah, so I think for me, it's a, it's a mixture of things similar to everyone else. Um, being more kind of business centric, I guess, just from a, from a background perspective, my first role um, or my first job post university was not in games. It was uh, working for a digital company and I've worked for pretty much digital companies all my life. Um, and for example, my first role, I focused on online marketing. So I learned um, kind of work, uh, digital um, e-commerce and, and uh, partnering with brands. And uh, I learned a lot about commercial sales and digital sales. Um, so that was really beneficial for me because the majority of my roles have all been revenue generating and generating income for a particular um, business. So that was really useful. Um, I kind of mentioned um, in, in the start that I studied marketing um, as my degree. I think that absolutely gave me the foundations in terms of understanding very basic marketing principles. So you know, even if it's the generic um, things like your Porter's Five Forces or um, or kind of Maslow's hier uh, hierarchy of needs, or um, even something as basic as the marketing mix, those kind of fundamentals I thought was really useful in terms of understanding how any type of business works, and especially in the marketing, um, any in any type of marketing role. Um, so I'd say that as well. And I guess in between roles, I, I was kind of picking up other kind of soft skills. So um, understanding how to use Photoshop, um, basic understanding of HTML, and because all companies are digital these days, those skills are always, always helpful and useful to know, um, especially if you're working for a digital company and all game companies are digital or have some kind of digital interface in some form. So I'd say that's useful um, too. Um, and I guess when I first started working uh, for King, um, that role was very much client focused. So I kind of mentioned this previously, which is relationship management, which is being able to work with people, um, understand um, schedules and deadlines. Um, there's a little bit of project management there as well, because you might end up working on some kind of big collaborative um, campaign that has a very tight deadline. And it's really about working with people internally and externally in terms of pulling all those things together. So you've really got to be able to um, speak to people, uh, uh, kind of communicate to people, uh, make it very clear what your goals and your objectives are. So we can all kind of achieve said goal by that deadline date. So I'd say those kind of skills have, have absolutely been useful. And I guess also specifically for me, having been interested in games and I, same, it's probably the same for everyone here is having a knowledge of, of the industry. So beyond just um, kind of who the major players are, it's really beneficial to understand what is a game publisher? What's a third party? Um, who is the developer? Um, a lot of the times, so I think a lot of people will hear some of the key names of or kind of big AAA studio names, but they might not understand the relationship between all the in-between studios who help to put something together. And from a business perspective, that's it, it's really important because sometimes you actually might not be working with this the big tent kind of name brand that you uh, that you've heard of. It might be someone else who's kind of pulling the strings, or at least is is more um, relevant in terms of uh, achieving your kind of marketing promotion or that kind of partnership or whatever it is that you're working on or towards. So um, a definite understanding of the, of the industry is, is really beneficial as well as all those kind of other things I mentioned in terms of business centric uh, marketing style roles, brand partnership roles, et cetera. Yeah, I'd absolutely echo that. Do your research. That's one of my biggest tips always is, you know, make sure you do understand our industry and that kind of gaming ecosystem. Now, Jade, your career is one that I often think people get put off by because, you know, they, they think, oh, I have to be incredible. Do you know what I mean? I have to be naturally good at this. I have to be naturally creative. And whilst I'm sure, you know, there's an element of that, what else do you, what can people build? What can they go out and learn that would make them good at this job beyond just being, you know, some kind of virtuoso? 
<laughs> sure. I think I think what scares a lot of people off is that like, oh, I should be a a virtuistic performer already, even before I I touch the computer and start to write music. Um, I actually with my experience with like just talking to loads of different people, there seems to be like two groups of audio people. Uh, one is like the really technical, like, yes, we, we know a lot of music theory, we know orchestration. So more like traditional music knowledge in that sense. And then the other group is like, Oh, I just make beats and it sounds really good. And there's not a lot of, <laughs> yeah, there's not a lot of um, interaction between the group because a lot of, people from this group people are like how did you get like those strings to sound good and then the other people are just like what's what's a chord for what's mixolydian what so yeah there's um yeah so basically that's happening and i guess all i can say is like try not to worry about labeling yourself it is okay to figure out what you like doing what you feel like are gaps in your knowledge there is always a place for you within the industry somehow and for me basically i've i've been kind of in both worlds i'm kind of more into like this camp now but i'm trying to get back into the traditional music camp just to brush up on my music theory and stuff um just because it's it's been a while i've, I've been here for a little while basically and and that's okay so just yeah build up on your soft skills, just talk to people. What is the music publishing doing in, in terms of what it's doing with, with the game industry? Um, what is like, you know, stuff like music rights as well. That's, that's a huge gray area that you need to be aware of. And yeah, also how to look after yourself, either financially, mentally, it's, it's a lot, it's a big world out there. And, and that's okay just to go at your own pace as well. It's a, it's a marathon and not a sprint to be in this industry. I feel like that's like just good advice for all of us isn't it? <laughs> yeah. this year. <laughs> Definitely something to remember. Yeah. Now I'm going to move on to our Q&A because we had some really fantastic questions sent in. So thank you so, so much if you did send in a question beforehand. Um, as I said, really great question. So I'm going to start off with, have you encountered any significant challenges throughout your career? Uh, Nida, I'm going to start with you there. Oh, God, that's a hard one. Um, so a big one for me has just been, I think, just evangelizing what UX is. I didn't realize how big part, of, like how big of an impact that would have on the job. So like for uh, UX is still fairly new in the industry, about 10, 15 years old. Um, so a big part of the job is just talking to people about what UX is and how it can support them. And for the business team, it's around, well, what return of investment will we get around that? What value will it bring? Um, and I completely understand it, right? Because um, it's complete, it's it's fairly new. Um, but it is just keeping an open dialogue. So something I do at NetSpeak is regular workshops where I'll talk about a part of UX I really care about um, and saying, this is how one game applied it really well and this is how one game did not apply it well and what can we learn from this? And then we'll apply that to like our game design. I also do a lot of workshops around standardization. So that could be like, defining what our game design principles are, which is a key thing. Uh, what are our UI pillars? So if we are creating a UI, what standards does that need to abide by? And then it, again, it ensures that we're all on the same page around that. Um, but it's an ongoing process. Um, and don't ever be put off by it. Like it's, it's a challenge, but it's a fun one. Like uh, people might push back, but then you're also showing people your passion about UX and UI. So it, it's a win-win for me. Oh, I love that. Again, just feels like good advice in general, doesn't it? You know, if it's something you're passionate about, fight for it. Um, Wayne, what's been your kind of biggest challenge in your career? Um, I guess the one of the biggest challenges has been around the, I guess probably the first challenge I, I personally found was, was getting into the, the industry. Um, like I said, it wasn't my first role um in terms of like full-time role so and because i wasn't a developer because i wasn't as creative as as uh some of the other panelists i couldn't go down that that road so it was really about having those transferable skills um as i mentioned earlier to kind of get into the sector and i think there's a lot of good things now i think events like this and um and various other kind of diversity groups i think are helping to kind of shine a light in terms of that um but yeah, I think that that for me was from a personal perspective was absolutely a, a challenge that I faced. Um, but I think from a general kind of career perspective in terms of 
working in the sector, I think there's been challenges in terms of um, the slight shift from um, the focus in terms of uh, a triple A game now is very different to what a triple game a triple A game was, say maybe even 10, 15 years ago, and therefore people's understanding of the business um, has changed dramatically. Uh, we now have free to play. We now have games as service. We now have mobile games. That's that's quite different. And and the reason why that's that's quite important is because when you're speaking to various, um, uh, I guess, decision makers um, who might be working at a brand or uh, some other partner that's not gaming related, and you want to speak to them about some kind of collaboration, they really need to understand this is what gaming looks like now or today. Um, it's not box retail. Um, which you thought or, or the audience and the demographic has changed. So thinking that it's just 15 year olds in their basement is, has, has changed massively. And I think that's been a big challenge to try and change um, that type of perception that actually video games are for everyone. Everyone likes games. Uh, people play games on various different devices. Um, so just purely from, I guess, um, a business perspective in terms of speaking to people who are decision makers and within a position of power, that's that kind of education um, uh, that we had to do from our side um, was a big kind of challenge, I, I guess, that we've, I feel like we've we've been able to um, accomplish. I definitely think you have. Also, I noticed I think we've been kicked out of our, of our studio in Animal Crossing, which I'm very sad about because <laughs> it was like the coolest studio ever. And I think we're now standing on a dock. Right. I think it's my fault because my internet, like I've connected it to my, I know I've connected it to my mobile because my internet's <laughs> terrible. And I think it, it, cause I could see that I'm home right now. I didn't leave on purpose. I swear. I swear. Yeah, sure. Sure. All right. Okay. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad that we know who to point the finger at. <laughs> so we know exactly ruined our gorgeous studio setup. Well, Abu, I'm going to come to you then. What's been your biggest challenge oh, aside from ruining this interview? Ruining it. Yeah. Well, well actually, it's, it's funny. It's funny because I was actually going to say teamwork. And obviously, I'm not a team player if I leave on my own. But uh, like, genuinely, I think one of the things, one of the biggest challenges was the is the idea of being able to communicate an idea or just communicating within a team. And it's like it's not necessarily a challenge that is, you know, that is really hard and hard to kind of overcome. It's just something I think, you know, it's it's really important to to realize that part of the whole game dev experience and, and actually building something is is part of working as a team and working, you know, to get to 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 make, you know, to communicate something uh, in, in the best way possible to everyone and have everyone on the same page and understand, but also be aware that sometimes uh, things need to change and you need to kind of cut things and you need to, you know, adapt things. Um, and to begin with, it's, it's hard because a lot of the time, you know, people sometimes who want to come into the creative industry or, you know, game, you know, game developing, they're like, I want to make my game. I want to make this game. And it, it doesn't work like that, uh, you know, a lot of the time. It's like you can make that game, but it's it's all part of a collaborative process. And that's what um, I think sometimes it can be quite hard to realize that and hard to learn that. But when you do, it becomes so much more of a beautiful process, the whole creative, the whole creative of this, of building this world. And I think, again, that's why I say it's, it's a challenge, but at the same time, it's, it, it isn't something that, it's ongoing and it is something that you will just learn to adapt to. But the more you kind of give in to that challenge, the, the better the result. Yeah, definitely. It does feel like kind of uh, communication, collaboration, empathy, you know, these are skills that we, we see come up time and time again. It's something that you've all touched on today it is something that I think our industry really thrives on and, and really does require from you. You are going to need to know how to work with other people. Abu, particularly you. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Jade, for you, you know, what, what are some of the biggest challenges that you face? What have you found difficult as you've built your career? The the biggest one that I actually still find challenging at the moment is just to keep going. Um, as I said before, like working in the game industry is is a marathon and not a sprint. It's when I first began, people like saying, like, oh, don't worry, once you get your first big gig, everything will just kind of start to fall into place. However, you know, when people say that, that doesn't mean like, like oh, your next big your next big gig will happen exactly next month. I'm like, okay, but what about 
the month after and what it, what about two years later, it's, it's difficult to, it can feel really challenging to like, you know, keep being active in the industry when you may not have safety nets behind you. Like what if you, you know, you need to pay rent, everyone needs to um, maybe look after family and all that. So it can be very difficult. Um, so my advice on that is, again, just be aware that, you know, a lot of it is also based on luck. And if things doesn't quite happen now, that is also okay. And, you know, you need to keep working within your own pace. Don't compare yourself to your friends or someone else. It's, you know, it's, you need to try and create and maintain a healthy relationship between you yourself and your work. And that's, that's something that I still find challenging today. And yeah, just keep going if you can. <laughs> Sorry, that, that wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't quite a, like a shortcut advice, but yeah, that, that is a challenge. <laughs> No, but I think that that's what we're looking for. You know, we don't want just um, try advice that's, you know, you can do it. It yeah. is about talking about the difficulty because, you know, sometimes games can be a difficult industry. And as you said, it is an industry where you do need to work really hard, but there is always an element of luck of meeting the right person, of a job coming up just when you're perfectly aligned to it, you know, so that yeah. it is important to acknowledge that because people do think that it's, you know, this incredible industry which it is, but, you know, you, you have this sense of when you arrive, everything is going to be perfect and magical and you've made it. And that's not the case. It is yeah. always work. It is still a job. So, you know, thank you. It is genuinely nice to have people be honest about, you know, what it looks like behind the scenes. It's not all, I was going to say fun and games. Oh, God, <laughs> that's awful. <laughs> So luckily, though, we do have a question that is a little bit more cheery. So we had a lovely question come through, which was basically, what has been the highlight of your career so far? So, Jade, I'm going to come straight back to you for that one. <laughs> um, so my highlight was when when I got my first gig, as in, like, um, this wasn't like a friend asking me to work on a game. It was an actual person I didn't know and uh, paying me to work on this gig and it was it was really really cool um so this gig was my my game uh dragon fin soup and it was released on the sony ps3 and ps vita and we got to travel and so that was my real highlight we went to gamescom just to show off our product and met so many different people and, and then later like um a year or two later we went to uh taiwan and japan as well to showcase at bit summit and the and other con conferences and yeah that is my highlight and now that i've experienced it i really want to remind myself of like you know when things are a bit tough like remember that really good time when you got to travel and you know there's always a chance that that will happen again uh you get to travel you get to meet new people see what other cool games are being developed and yeah that's my personal highlight <laughs> oh i love that that's a really good one you started yeah. this off really well nida can you follow it up what's your what's your career highlight oh god how am i gonna beat that um <laughs> Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, so I think I'm currently living one, which is really nice. So I'm I'm working on my first game where I've worked on it from start to release. And like we're still developing, obviously, but like soon I'll be able to say I've worked on a game that I've shipped. Um, like that is an amazing feeling. Um, and also another one. Sorry, I just want to do a second one, which is really nice. Um, yeah, go for it. Work I've done with Pop and Play, which is. So the aim of Pop and Play is to get more people of colour into the industry. Um, but we started about a year and a half ago, nearly two years. And the way I joined that team was through networking, which has come up a lot. Um, just meeting people at the right time. Um, and in the past week, we've run a, a, a hashtag called I am Pop and Play, um, which is just people of colour in the industry on Twitter, like showcasing their work and their skill set. And we've had over a couple hundred people from all over the world of different ethnicities, job roles, skill sets contributing. And it's really nice and fulfilling to see other people like you achieving amazing things. And it's been a really big motivating force for me in my day-to-day -day work, but also really great in that we can build a platform for other people where they feel safe enough to talk about their experiences and who they are. Um, so continuing that work will be great, I think. <laughs> 
I mean, yeah, if you haven't heard of Park of Play, first of all, you should have. Park and Play is amazing, but they, they're really incredible. Do please do go and check out their work. You know, it's absolutely fantastic. If you are somebody from kind of a diverse background, you're feeling a little bit anxious about how you might fit into the games industry. These are the people you need. Do go and have a look at the hashtag. It's I am Park and Play. It's so amazing. There are so many brilliant people on there. Loads of really cool jobs that, you know, even I working in this industry didn't know about, hadn't kind of uh, heard of before. And, you know, as Nita said, lots and lots of really cool work being showcased. So please go and check that out. I hugely recommend it. Abu, what's your highlight? Apparently, uh, my highlight is leaving dramatically uh, Animal Crossing. <laughs> uh, ruining everyone. So, uh, I think, I think you know, a massive highlight for me is 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 just realizing how open and um, and helpful that the actual game industry is. I think having come from the you know from from film and TV and and being in this space where it is is as it is open and helpful to a degree, but I think the game industry are so welcoming and are really kind of, and, you know, again, from someone who has never, never made a game before, who's never done game dev before to now be in a position where, you know, where I am talking to other collaborators and collaborating to make a game. I mean, it just speaks volumes as to, as to how welcoming the, the industry is and just the, the lovely people that I've met within that space as well. I think, that just it just keeps on giving to be honest and that that keeps it there's so many highlights from that i find and i feel um yeah oh that's a lovely one too i really like that i do think we have a really welcoming industry so yeah i would totally agree with that uh wayne for you what's kind of been your biggest best moment in your career so far um i've had quite a few actually if i'm if i'm honest which is a good thing um i would say the one that i always think back to is uh, I worked on a partnership with Universal Music and an artist called Sai, who people probably won't remember. He did this song called Gangnam Style, and so worked on some kind of collaboration with him and, and with Candy Crush. And so that was that was at the time was really really exciting. But I'd say the biggest career highlight um, to date has probably been a lot of the work that I did at, at Warchild. Um, we just we it was very kind of early days in terms of doing kind of collaborations with the gaming sector as an NGO. Um, but it, there was just so much potential and the industry, industry really just embraced us in terms of a lot of the crazy ideas that we had. And, and so did the charity in terms of a lot of things that I proposed. Um, and yeah, just, we just, we just, we did so much. Um, we, we worked on a game with Bandai Namco, um, uh, created like DLC. I mean, I, that's the only game I've ever been, I'm in the credits, um, having worked on that DLC. Um, I've worked with Bethesda on a on a concert that we did. So we did a, a live concert for um, all of the Bethesda titles at the Hammersmith Apollo back in 2018, I think. Um, we, we yeah, we kind of launched so many cool initiatives that I'm I'm really proud of, um, and they're still doing good work now. Um, so yeah, for anyone who's interested in kind of supporting them, I do highly highly recommend that you check them out. Yeah, I'd agree. That's War Child, by the way. Do go and look at the work they're doing. It's really fantastic. So I'm going to move on to our next question. Um, so I really like this one because I think we've touched on it a little bit, but did you plan out your career or have you ended up where you are by chance and, and going with the flow? Abu, I'm going to throw that one to you. You know, yeah, you know what? I, the, <laughs> one of the big things I've learned is that you can't plan really for anything. <laughs> like, I think... I would have, I think you can have, you can, you can aspire and you can aim to go somewhere and you can, you know, go, you know, you could do the things that you love and really enjoy. And I think that is, if, as, as long as you're enjoying and you're assessing everything and seeing if you enjoy something rather than constantly having this aim of trying to do something that you think you'll enjoy. I think that's one of the, one of the biggest learnings I've had, especially as like, as an actor, as as you know as a game developer it's just just as a human being you know you've got to constantly be assessing the space you are in and seeing if you enjoy it or if you don't and yeah i i mean i you know if you if you told me like a two two years ago two three years ago that i'd be you know starting a game studio you know wanting to make really really cool games 
I probably would have laughed and said, but I haven't got my, you know, massive acting job yet. Or like, you know, I haven't got this yet. So I think there is, it's, it's, yeah, I, I'd say there was a, there was an idea there, but it wasn't necessarily a plan that I, that I completely stuck with. But when I decided that I wanted to do something and I was fully enjoying it, I really committed. And I think that's the difference, right? If you enjoy something and you really love it, commit to it a hundred percent and you will get so much more out of it. Um, yeah. Wayne, your career feels as though it was actually quite structured, but is that just an illusion where you kind of frantically paddling under the surface? No, this is going to sound really boring, but I, I kind of <laughs> planned my entire career <laughs> today. Um, I would say like, um, and this, and I'm not just literally saying this because this is um, in between Smash Brothers, but I remember <laughs> um, playing this uh, Smash Brothers melee on GameCube around the same time. And I think um, Reggie Philomy, um, who was uh, president of Nintendo, I remember him being around Nintendo of America around the same time. And I remember kind of saying to myself, I want that job, like, or I want to work within gaming and doing something quite prominent within marketing. Um, and at the time I was, I was quite young, so I must have been, yeah, the, a, a nerdy type of thing to kind of say that that's what I want to be or where I want to be. But I would say absolutely I've kind of kind of guided myself um, in the industry to kind of to be where I am now. I'm very much went, uh, found that, that first role in the industry, um, wanted to have, um, uh, build a network uh, with publishers and developers across the, the globe. Um, so have been doing that for the last four or five years. I uh, wanted to have a real strong understanding of, um, of digital and um, the sector of large and so i felt confident so i felt that i could actually lead. i can um that i can kind of be as creative as i can within those fields um so absolutely uh, yeah i think i have absolutely kind of planned um where i am and uh, i think a lot of things i kind of mentioned in terms of um the skill sets required um to do these jobs i would say i kind of intentionally uh, planned Oh, so not just an illusion, and you are as good as you sound. How annoying, how irritating. Yeah. <laughs> Jade, tell me a little bit about your, you know, for you, how your career has panned out. Did you intend to be kind of exactly where you are? Nope. <laughs> not, not at all. It's, uh, <laughs> I think I did try to plan, and I found that it really didn't work out for me because I was putting a lot of extra 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 pressure on myself and that made me worry more about the extra pressure rather than what I was doing so before then when when I did try it, I was just like right okay I'll finish I'll finish university in like maybe two or three years time I'll get a studio job or you know xyz and then I'll I'll move out you know I'll move out here I'll travel here just like no <laughs> so when I try yeah as as the kind of the months and the years went by, I just found that that was just so stressful and I just wasn't enjoying anything. So now I'm just like, okay, have I got enough safety nets behind me? Like, cool, I'm going to give uh, going in this direction a little bit of a go just to see what is happening. And I felt that that works for me fine. And But also, if you are the person who plans out everything and you can hit your goals because it just works for you, go for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I like that. That's the thing is, is I think it's worth having a plan, isn't it? But it's also worth recognizing yeah. that sometimes life is going to strongly disagree with your plan and you do have to have that ability yeah. to, to go with the flow when that happens. So, you know, I think you're a great example yeah. of that. <laughs> so Nida, tell me a little bit about your career. Again, same question. Are you where you thought you'd be? No, but I'm happy where I am. So I, think <laughs> I had no idea what I wanted to do when I was at university. I was really stressed, like a lot of people are. Like, what am I going to do when I graduate? Um, and this opportunity of getting an internship at Game Studio came up and I said yes. Um, that's a big key learning I've had is just say yes to anything that sounds interesting. Assuming you have like the money and the stuff to like, uh, you know, fall back on and stuff. Um, and that's been really useful for me. Um, and then from then on, even though I haven't had like a proper plan, I've been thinking a lot more about what values I want to give up, like have personally going ahead and what do I want to talk about going ahead? What types of projects do I want to work on? What types of people 
I think uh, like if you've asked me a year ago about what I wanted to do with my career, I would have listed out a bunch of studios I want to work for. Whereas now, it, for me, it's less about the studio. It's more about the projects and the people. Um, and especially with UX, like because it's so new, you can make your job up as you go along. Just find out what you're interested in and find the right people to work with and collaborate with going ahead. Um, I'm less stressed about it than I was before. But yeah, again, remember, like you can change your career choice whenever you want. Like nothing's stopping you. You can try out a variety of things. Like when I first started in the industry, I was looking to get into marketing, actually. And I realized that didn't work for me. And then I shifted into UX and I realized that's a much better fit for me. Um, so no one's going to stop you. Just aim whatever you want to do and you'll get there eventually. Oh, I love it. Well, that's the kind of perfect way to head into our final question, which I cannot believe we're already at the end of the panel. But lastly, the obvious final question is, what is your advice for anybody who is watching today and wants to do what you do and wants to get into the games industry? So Nida, I'm going to come straight back to you for this one. Well, there's so many things you can be doing. I think it's just putting yourself out there and being fairly proactive in your approach. Uh, so for example, with me is I didn't really have a network cause I studied psychology. I didn't study games. So I went on the internet and build like a Twitter account, uh, and started putting out my thoughts on games and UX out there. And through that, I found work. I've also gone to networking events or now that we're revolt There's a bunch of online events you can go to and build those networks. I think just talking to people, whether they are in the same discipline as you or not, you are going to learn so much about how the industry works, what skills you need. Uh, and what steps you can take going ahead. Um, and through that, you'll build a lot of friendships as well. Like, I think we don't talk about that enough. It's just the people you meet. Like, a lot of them will be lifelong friends or peers or people you work with in the future even um, and keep those relationships close. Um, so relationships and networking and also just persevering through it, right? There will always be hurdles as you go through, but if you've got a strong network that you build as you go along, you'll be okay. Oh no, we're off to a flying start. That was so good. I already feel bad to hand over to anybody else. Wayne, what would your tips be for somebody who wants to do what you do? Um, for me, I would say uh, very much around kind of understanding the sector, as I kind of mentioned earlier, um, read industry news websites. Um, so places like gi.biz, MC Develop. Um, I think uk has got a great set of resources in terms of understanding the sector um, and um, how things are kind of um, set out. Um, so that would be, probably be the first kind of advice, which is around understanding the industry a little bit better as opposed to just the entertainment side of things. Because I think it's easy for anyone to go onto, say, YouTube and, and Twitch to kind of see someone creating gaming content. But if you really understand the industry at large, um, I would suggest going to those dedicated more um, industry focused sites um, for for any type of business role and, and if you kind of already have an idea or inkling of where potentially you might want to be so whether it's in say um, I don't know uh, uh, marketing or, or partnerships or even uh, something slightly different uh, like PR or whatever it is um, I would say have a look at uh, places like LinkedIn, like see what roles already exist. What are people doing and what skills uh, they already have to do that? Where have they previously worked? Um, ask a parent or guardian in terms of a thing, a site like that. Maybe there's um, they, they might have access to that somewhere. Um, but those resources out there, I, 20 years ago, I didn't see all the jobs were available in the industry, but now it's very easy to see uh, what is available. So i probably say, um, look what's out there, look at people that potentially you might want to be or have similar roles to in the future. Fantastic. Abu, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I've just got, I mean, Dwayne's stolen it all, really. Both, both, both <laughs> Wayne and Edith. Like, generally, they, it, it's, that's it, right? You've, you've got to be, you've, you've got to be, have, you know, an ear to the ground in regards to, like, what's going on, you know, checking talking to people. I think communication is key. I think that's one of the biggest uh, things that I've, I've, I, where I've learned a lot from is by talking and asking questions. I think there is no such thing as, as, as a wrong or a stupid question. I think it's all about asking just, even if it is, even if you feel it is the most mundane question, it's, it's so important because one person might say something different to another. And I think that, that's how that's the biggest advice i would give is just talk to people because 
again, you know, the more the, the more we talk about it and the more open we are in regards to how to get into this industry, I think the the more accessible and open it becomes. And um yeah, that's 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 it. And yeah, as I said, like you know, read up. I mean, YouTube's amazing for resources in regards to like learning about you know design or different about elements and stuff. There are the, there are these things out there as well to kind of uh, focus on. But yeah, that would definitely is a is is kind of what I would suggest. Now, Jade, I'm so sorry because you are in the worst <laughs> position here. We've had three <laughs> incredible answers. <laughs> Do you have anything to add? What would be your advice to someone who wants to do particularly what you do? I think I think just to start it off with a general, general advice is yeah. um, definitely focus on soft skills because you can always pick up like technical things like how does Photoshop work? How, how does this plugin in uh, Unity work, for example? You know, that can be picked up a little bit later when you find the right mentor or just ask people asking people on the internet, what people can't really teach you is like how to be a good person. <laughs> so yes, definitely focus on the soft skills, um, uh, emotional intelligence and, you know, like how to read the room and, you know, just general people skills. That's, that is something that I can't, you know, it's, I highly recommend that. Um, in terms of like maybe writing music for games or audio stuff, um, try things out. If, if you're not very technically sure about something, maybe try fiddling with a tutorial about uh, with Wise or whatever, or FMOD, just give it a go. Um, other people say, oh, you should specialize in something. And actually that advice backfired on me because I was too specialist in, in a particular music genre, which is Japanese taiko drumming and Indonesian gamelan. So I'm just like, yes, I'm a specialist, but no one knows about it. So that advice is backfired on me. So my advice to counter that is to just give things a go. Uh, find your feet, uh, find your voice, uh, find out what you want to create, and then it'll be much easier to find the communities to help you with your own vision and your own personal goals. I hope that's okay. <laughs> I mean, that was spectacular. What a way to finish it off. You totally did have a good job. That was absolutely wonderful. So yeah, good job. Because I know it's hard to go last after a question like that. So that was absolutely fantastic. But thank you. that is all we've got time for. So, you know, I cannot say thank you enough to our wonderful panel. They were absolutely fantastic. Nida, Jade, Wayne, Abubakar, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you at home got as much out of that as I did, because I really enjoyed it. Even, even if Abu stormed off in the middle of it and ruined our beautiful I animal crossing. I didn't mean to. I didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Those people skills still got a little bit of work to do there, Abu. But other oh. than that, thank you for your <laughs> thank you for your incredible advice. As I said, I hope that you have learned as much as I have today. Do go and check out some of the resources that we've mentioned. I'm sure they're going to be online and you can check out the Digital Schoolhouse website. But for now, I've been Ella Citywood. That is it from our careers panel and we will be back right after this break. Goodbye. <laughs>